So, good morning. We've just come back from uh, the Stations of the Cross uh, in the Bear Island Church, led by Pauline Peters. A very beautiful, moving uh, reflection of Alexio on the uh, on the main theme of uh, today, which is the the dying of Jesus. And it's always interesting, uh, Good Friday is, I think, maybe after Ash Wednesday, uh, the most popular day of the liturgical year for many people. Many people who you never see in church uh, during the year uh, come to church on Good Friday. And uh, many of those who feel that they really want to come on Good Friday would not see the same importance, significance in, uh, in Easter Sunday or the Saturday Vigil. And uh, maybe that's a failure of the Church's communication of the, of the real and the full meaning of, uh, of Easter and Holy Week, what the religious experience that we've been talking about really means. But it's also something significant that uh, people are drawn to uh, the remembering, the making present of this, uh, of this moment of Jesus' uh, last sufferings and his death. Actually, as we were driving back up the, the lane, uh, we stopped and offered a lift to somebody and she said, uh, no, I'm going to the dead house. And the, somebody has died on the island, uh, or has been buried here shortly. And uh, as is the custom here, um, they go to, the friends and neighbours go to visit. So death is a very uh, social event. Uh, it brings long lost relatives uh, out of the woodwork, uh, not just looking for their place in the will, but uh, because this is a significant moment in the life of, not, of all the family, of all, everyone involved. And it's a significant moment in our own lives. And of course, we live with the awareness of death uh, continuously, uh, mm -hmm. after a certain age, it seems to dawn on us quite young, I think it's four or five, something like that, the child be becomes aware of death as existing in the world, that people go away and don't come back. Um, and so, although most of the time we keep this awareness uh, under wraps or push it out of our mind, uh, it's there, influencing us all the same. And uh, St. Benedict says that we should keep death constantly before our eyes, which sounds perhaps to modern ears a bit morbid, thinking about death all the time. But uh, that's not the uh, tradition, it's not the meaning of this tradition of the memento mori, the remembrance of death, which we find uh, in the Christian tradition, but we also find in all other traditions. I was once um, sitting with a, a, a Buddhist abbot in Thailand, uh, talking with him in his room and he was looking around. Uh, he had to leave the room for a moment. I was just, so I was sitting, I was looking at his pictures and I was quite shocked um, actually to see uh, the pictures uh, of very graphic um, death scenes, uh, mutilated bodies and uh, people have been killed in car accidents and so on. And uh, my first thought was this is a very um, strange, strange thing to have uh, pictures around your room. Uh, and then I realized, of course, it was part of one of their techniques or one of their methods of remembering death is to uh, visually reflect upon the uh, upon our mortality and to face that and these are rather graphic and for us I think rather excessive the 
graphic images, although many of our crucifixes uh, and uh, in many parts of the world, particularly southern Latin countries, uh, the graphic nature of the suffering of Christ is a, a very important part of the, the day. And the film uh, The Passion of the Christ, which I refuse to see, uh, seemed to have had the same impact uh, on people that seem to be much more focused actually upon the graphic pain and the lacerations and the so on, than the gospel itself is. The gospel accounts don't dwell uh, in that way, and it can become a slightly morbid and uh, unhealthy fascination with the trappings of death, uh, as we see in so many Hollywood movies, uh, which seem to compete with each other to uh, become as graphic and as realistic and as nauseating as possible. And, uh, but the, the Gospels don't dwell on that aspect of it. We know that Jesus was nailed to the cross and we know that what that must have been like and the crucifix is a, a sign of that. But there's not an excessive concentration upon that because the cross itself has its significance in another light. It's not in the light of pain or of suffering. It is in the light that, uh, of love. John Main used to say when you look at the cross uh, and contemplate it as we do today, we should not really say to ourselves we are saved by the suffering of Christ, but we are saved, healed, liberated by the love of God present in Christ at that moment in his whole being. And I think that's, that is actually a bigger distinction, uh, a bigger difference uh, than we may think or than it may sound like at first. So I'd like to just reflect with you a little bit and in the light of Pauline's uh, reflections, which I have remembered, uh, share with you some reflections on this and then maybe we'll have a little time to share quietly ab about um, the meaning of the cross for us on this Good Friday uh, before we meditate together. Jesus was now taken in charge and carrying his own cross went out to the place of the skull, as it is called, or in the Jew, Jews language, Golgotha, where they crucified him and with him two others, one on the right, one on the left, and Jesus between them. That moment uh, of Jesus' crucifixion is not an isolated moment. That's why we uh, remember the way of the cross. Something leads up to this moment, it happens, and then we have to get used to a new way of life after this moment. That's the dynamic of death in life. We prepare for death, more or less consciously, more or less courageously. Uh, death comes inevitably, and by death here we can take a general definition of death, not just the moment of biological death, but uh, many uh, many, if not daily, uh, deaths. In fact, every breath we take is a kind of dying, an expiration. So, uh, death is an event in life. It has something that precedes it, and that's what gives it meaning. But, and then we have to get used to it 
we have to absorb it, to face it, live with it, live with death, and then we move on, because it is such a big event <coughs> that uh, we can't pretend it hasn't happened. If somebody you have loved dies, you can't, you don't just suddenly wipe your hands and say, okay, well, let's get on with life. You are living a new life, and it will take you time, of course, to absorb or to adapt. But today, in particular, we focus on the death itself. But we wouldn't be doing that if it weren't for the next step in the 15th station, which we uh, prepare for tomorrow and begin to articulate, begin to celebrate uh, tomorrow evening at the vigil. Like many things that we fear, death is one of the things we fear, the hour of our death, but it's not usually like what we imagined it would be. If we fear the death of someone we love, then when that moment of death happens, there is often a, a very surprising moment of transcendent peace in the actual hour or moment of death. There is a sense of a completion, uh, of a consummation. And Jesus, in some versions of the Gospels, uh, says, consummatum est, it is finished, it's done, I've done my work. And uh, just as when you finished cooking a meal or you finished uh, a job that you've been working on or something you've been writing, or uh, when it's done, there is a moment of uh, satisfaction or a moment of relief or release or of rest or a Sabbath rest after the exertion that you've been putting out to do it. So you say, it's done, it's over. So with that comes, uh, sometimes anyway, a sense of, um, of peace, of fulfillment. And often those who are attending a death um, feel strangely surprised by what they discover uh, in themselves, in the person who's dying, in the mood, in the atmosphere of the room, uh, at that moment. It's like more like being at a birth in some ways than being at a death. So strong can be the sense of a breaking through or of an arrival. But soon after the moment has passed, the emptiness and the absence flood in. Because our normal minds, our normal ways of perception cannot any longer, they were charged, or sensitized or energized for a moment to be aware of what was uh, being broken through into. Often people will say at that moment, uh, if the person who's dying looks at them or uh, communicates in some way to them, uh, they, they see, it is as if they are seeing uh, the next life that they, they are moving into, and that communicates itself to the people with them. I had an experience of that uh, when I was with Mother Teresa's house for the dying some years ago, and uh, she uh, they sent me over to a young emaciated figure on the ground who had been brought in the night before off the streets, and they, she said he's probably He's dying, he probably may even be dead now. He was just turned on his side in a fetal position on the floor. So they said, so would you go over and give him a blessing? So I went over and I knelt beside him. His face was turned away from me. I knelt down and I just put my hand gently on his shoulder to see if he was conscious. And then, uh, to my surprise, he turned quite energetically <laughs> towards me as if I'd woken him up. 
And uh, that was my first feeling, was I disturbed him. But then uh, he looked at me directly uh, and incredibly uh, peacefully and joyfully. And his eyes were, I've never seen such bright eyes, such uh, incredible clarity and consciousness and joyfulness and love. Just every possible manifestation of the goodness of, uh, that we are capable of as human beings flooding through that look and uh, didn't say anything of course but just blessed me and then turned over and died so there's a not, not infrequent uh, moments uh, when we are in the presence of death that we can see what the other person is seeing as they, as they seem to move over or drift over or pass over to another level of existence. Um, but as soon as that moment is over and the biological clock has stopped, then uh, the, the absence and the emptiness uh, can flood in, depending upon the depth of our relationship to that person. Uh, because our normal mind simply cannot any longer uh, see or make sense of what, for a brief moment, we might have seen. It's something that we glimpsed through the veil that surrounds us uh, in our daily life. At that moment we might have seen or sensed the, the finding that accompanies every loss. There's no loss in life, however terrible, that does not lead to some finding. But we don't always see that immediately, of course. A pivotal moment in the uh, liturgy of the Passion that we celebrate this afternoon at three o'clock, the traditional time of the death of Jesus, um, is the veneration of the cross. And everybody in the church is invited to come forward and they come forward to uh, kneel or kiss the cross as they wish and it's a very powerful moment, I think, in the Christian year. And I've always, there always seems to be a moment of great communion. As you know or may know, the, in the Catholic Church, the uh, Mass is the one day, of, uh, sorry, Good Friday is the one day of the year that Mass is not celebrated. And I think, uh, but at the liturgy this afternoon, there is a communion service after the veneration of the cross. I actually personally always think it's not necessary, but it's the custom, so we do it. But uh, I think I think the the uh, the meaning of Good Friday, I mean, we don't have mass, so that's significant. The church is wise enough to say we don't have mass on Good Friday, but it seems to me a little bit of a compromise to say, okay, but we'll give communion. But, and I'm not making a big deal about that, but, uh, but I think uh, at the, the moment of the veneration of the cross is, for most people, and for many of those who come to the church uh, just once a year for that, uh, a real moment of communion. And it's a moment, of course, where we are all equal. It's a great leveller. It isn't a priest who is giving you communion, or anyone who is giving you communion, but uh, it is you who are just everybody, equally, coming forward in equal discipleship. Everybody is just a disciple, it doesn't matter who you are, what you're wearing, or whether you are a prime minister, or whether you are a <coughs> professor, or whether you are street cleaner or whether you are archbishop or whoever you are you 
uh, we are all equal in a very um, clear and humble way uh, in front of the cross, just as death is a great leveller, we're all going to die. And uh, but in the f in, in the veneration of the cross, we accept that consciously uh, in the person of Jesus, who we venerate at that moment as our teacher. So we become strangely closer to each other in the presence of. Uh, of the cross and of our veneration of it. Death always uh, presents us with a challenge and we have to respond to it. And the more conscious we are, uh, the more we, we learn from death, which is itself a hard but powerful teacher. Until we've experienced the death of someone we love, our understanding of life is probably quite, or as yet, incomplete. Nobody, I remember as a, as a boy suddenly being aware, you must, be, must have just been reading something or hearing something, and uh, suddenly was aware that death you know, was around, and uh, that people seemed to be quite, uh, seemed to take it quite seriously, and uh, I thought, I've never, I, I, I don't know what it is. I've never experienced the death of anyone close to you. And then, unless it's, unless it is somebody close to you, I think the full impact of death doesn't, uh, doesn't strike you. Now, of course, I don't say I actually prayed for that to happen, but uh, it wasn't long before uh, I did experience it. And then, uh, and then you're different. Very different after someone close to you uh, has, has died. So death is a tough uh, teacher. And we don't have to anticipate that, uh, that particular lesson, but uh, it is going to come, probably, to all of us at some point. So our understanding of life is, uh, is, is strangely deepened. It can be horribly affected, but it is deepened. And death, which seems at first to negate life, seems just a terrible negation that no one would choose. Uh, nevertheless, it seems to enhance it in some way, or it throws it open, it expands our understanding of life. We would rather it we didn't have to do it that way, but that's the way it is. Because it challenges us to ask if life has meaning, has purpose. Now you might say, in a humanitarian, humanist sort of way, you might say, well, of course life has meaning, you can do good for others, you can create some things that might last for some time, and uh, that's enough. And uh, we, we can't argue with anybody else's uh, sense of meaning. We have to respect everybody's point of view in this sort of field. <coughs> but um, I think most of us would say, well, okay, it's certainly better that life has that level of meaning, that we are doing some good in the world. We're contributing to the well-being of others in some way and in fact that's how we ourselves can live more peacefully more fully if we are turned generously in the spirit of service and compassion uh, to others 
that we help them, but we especially we help those who are helpless. So that's not a bad uh, discovery of meaning, and there are many religious, fanatical religious people who have not found even that level of meaning uh, because they become fixated on some other <coughs> more you know, abstract you know, ideological explanation. So, but at the same time, I think the human soul, the human spirit, uh, seeks meaning always beyond the obvious. Is there something else? Beyond the horizon that we can see and measure, is there something beyond that horizon? And of course, as we move towards the horizon, we discover that the horizon is movable. That the horizon moves as we move, as we grow. And so the experience of meaning becomes deeper and richer and more mysterious. In the ancient world, um, the question of death, which was of course much more present, more often uh, to people, people died younger, there was much higher infant mortality, and probably life was more violent uh, than, than we uh, experience it today, most of us. Uh, but in the ancient world, the meaning of life was also a question, a problem, and the answer <coughs> was generally found in the heroic uh, age, anyway, uh, in the idea of fame or glory. That it was really, certainly through death, that you could, best of all, achieve a glorious memory you would be, people would write uh, great epics about you and uh, the soldiers uh, would uh, speak about you and sing about you and so this was really the only way to survive otherwise as we know, as they knew, uh, memories are short and people fade from memory even, in a sense, the memory of those we were closest to and loved most. We don't forget them, but the memory fades in, as grief uh, uh, fades. Grief is a kind of a biological impact in many ways. And as the body uh, recovers from the impact of grief, so, and life goes on, we, we wish it wouldn't go on at a certain point. We may even feel guilty because life does go on. And we hang on to the grief out of a sense of loyalty to the one who has died. So we, but we have to pass through that. We go through that stages of grief, grief corresponding to the, ways, to the way of the cross or the stations of the cross. Mm -hmm. So the stages of dying and grieving are uh, steps we have to take, each of us individually. So, uh, in a sense, we are all doomed to be forgotten. And that worries us. I don't know, maybe it does, some people. Um, maybe it doesn't worry us so much, but uh, maybe it worries you if you start thinking about it. But it certainly it certainly uh, it makes you think, it makes you ask if all of the hullabaloo of my life, all of the decisions, all of the questions, all of the struggles, all of the doubts, all of the dilemmas of what should I do, what should we do, and so on, if all of this that I'm feeling so intensely now, and all of the wonderful gifts and graces in my life, and the people I, who've taught me to love, and the people I love, and so on, all of this, if it all is just snuffed out, not only snuffed out, but actually just fades from memory, unless you happen to write the Iliad, or 
Hamlet or something, but even then, there's <laughs> uh, not much, much view left in it. So, so what is the meaning of it all? And that is an important question, that does matter, because it actually decides how we live. It decides how we enter into the struggle of life, how we are faithful to our relationships, and how we accept the process of growth that is at the heart of life. So, meaning is important. It's not just an abstract um, thought. And in the light of Christ, which sheds a much brighter light on humanity's problems and questions than the ancient heroic ideal of fame or glory, the light of Christ illuminates uh, life, meaning and death. And that's why perhaps this is the most popular day of the year in the Church's uh, calendar for many people, because it seems to bring us to a, a place where we can identify ourselves with Jesus, who we may see both as a heroic individual, as a noble human being, and as an archetype who speaks to all humanity. There's no serious religious person anywhere in the world of any faith who doesn't who doesn't feel and see the significance or the importance of, of Jesus and of the cross. Um, so we approach the cross as a way of helping us to live this life better, or fully, or deeply, more humanly. The Stations of the Cross that Pauline uh, led us through in the church this morning, uh, 14 of these stations, and um, I, I, I was actually asking her if she would record those for um, what we'll do on a, a video and put it up later. It's a kind of lexio. But so I, I was going to go through them all, but I think uh, it's a bit long to go through them all. Uh, but those, the one thing we can say is that they represent stages. Stages or angles. Angles from which we look at the meaning of our experience. We, we move from the first station, which is the, when Jesus accepts, uh, when Jesus is condemned. It's like a Kafka <coughs> moment, a Kafka-esque moment, a dream, a uh, nightmare, really, where we are, we may dream ourselves uh, to be condemned, that we realize that the forces of the world or fate have turned against us and the wheel of fortune has reached its, its lowest level. And that's the moment we all dread, it's a moment of dread. Um, and that's where it starts, this particular reflection on this, on this day of um, contem contemplating the cross. And we move through many, many angles or windows uh, in the Stations of the Cross <clears throat> that bring us finally through the Jesus meeting his mother Jesus being helped with the cross uh, the three falls that Jesus uh, undergoes as he's carrying his cross where it's too much for him where he can't take it anymore <coughs> he just collapses under it uh, where he is stripped uh, like the uh, victims in Auschwitz or prisoners taken into a prison 
in order to be degraded humanly because when we are degraded it's easier to treat us uh, as refuse or to kill us. Then the nailing, uh, the sheer pain of the cross, the dying, and then the, the last two uh, stations, the, uh, the pieta, the, uh, one of the most uh, powerful uh, images that Christianity has, um, has generated, which is the, the body of Jesus in the arms of his mother, um, a symbol of, of life and death. And, and then finally, the, uh, the closure, uh, the putting of the body into the tomb, uh, the end of the, the rituals, and the end of the story in, every, in any ordinary way of perception, just the natural end. Uh, literally, the closing, the closure of the tomb, and uh, the carrying on of life uh, without him, because life carries on for those uh, who survive. So these stations of the cross, I think, uh, evoke in us, if we give it the time, give them the time to reflect on them, uh, they evoke for us uh, profound uh, images and insights into our own experience of life and meaning and death. And I think we have to sit with that before we get on to the 15th station, uh, but we have to sit with that. And that's why conventionally there are only 14. It ends with the entombment because that's where the story ends and it's, we can tell no more, we can say no more in detail about what may happen after that. And uh, what happens after that uh, remains to be seen. But if we know it, and that's what we prepare for tomorrow, it's what we enter into in the, in the climax of the Easter services, which is, which is the vigil uh, tomorrow night. If we can see it, we glimpse it, but we see it in a very different way from the way we have seen what led up to it. So, we can, uh, before we meditate now, if you like, we can take a, a few minutes if anyone would like to share anything. Just, just to say what we're doing today, we'll meet in the... I, I suggested last night that you talk among yourselves with the people you're sharing with to decide uh, what kind of silence you will practice today as part of the retreat. So if you haven't done that, you should have done it. Uh, but it, it's a useful thing to, uh, to, be, to have an agreement uh, on how you uh, spend the day. But at 3 o'clock we have uh, the liturgy of the uh, of Good Friday in the church. And then, uh, for those who'd like to, after the, immediately after the liturgy, uh, we'll take a walk, there'll be a silent walk. Uh, and then from the church, somewhere. And then uh, we'll have meditation here, for those who'd like to come here, you may prefer to be on your own, uh, or we'll, we'll be here, I'll be here anyway, at six o'clock. Uh, for meditation and we'll just keep that uh, a completely silent meditation in the sense that we won't have any preparation or conclusion to it, we'll just come we'll start on time and we'll finish on time and, uh, but we'll come and go in silence